In June 1940, with the forces of Nazi Germany threatening invasion, every able man was being called to arms to defend the country. Britain called upon the women they left behind to fill the gaps in the country's workforce. The whole country really would have come to a standstill without the help of the women. Everybody had something to do, and everybody was pulling their weight. And some women leapt at the chance of this new form of liberation. I'd have paid them to let me do it. It seemed a superb job. The women of Britain were about to step away from their kitchens and help save the nation. On the 4th of June, 1940, the British forces sent to aid the collapsing French army were finally driven from the beaches of France by the advancing German war machine. Now every able-bodied man was called to arms to defend Britain's shores against this seemingly unstoppable enemy. At the time, everything was so uncertain. I mean, we just imagined the enemy landing on our shores and. And, and taking out everything over. And, uh, and it really wasn't until things got going and the Battle of Britain started that we thought, well, here we are fighting, you know, how long is it going to last? The women of Britain weren't about to let their men fight alone. They were determined to play their part in the conflict, even if it meant overturning traditional ways of thinking. World War I, all the people in the armed services were men. In World War II, um, women were in the war just as much as men were. I mean, the First World War, I know there were ambulance drivers and nurses, but uh, the Second World War definitely was the women coming into their own, and that was the, the revolution, really, of, of women taking men's jobs. I mean, there were women on buses, there were women everywhere uh, to release the men. People had to accept that we could do just about everything that the men could do and accept us on, on, on the level. I suppose that was the beginning of, of feminism that perhaps went too far at the time. The tide was turning. From doing only basic jobs in the First World War, the door to women's freedom had been unlocked, and many were eager to step through it. But not all the men they met were happy about it. I was the first woman on Cranwell with a few others, and uh, that was a very much a, a male-dominated place. They were horrified to see women coming in. So we had a guard outside who used to escort us to the classroom. <laughs> The men certainly didn't think that women would cope in frontline stations. We were the first women plotters on the station. I don't think uh, some of the male plotters were very happy about having to leave and go and fight. To start with, they're very resentful. They didn't like it because if we released them, they were going to go on active duty. In 1940, the front line was the shores of England, and the enemy was soon to attack from the sky. The Air Force sent women into the male-dominated RAF operations rooms to work as plotters, signalers, and radio operators, or, as they called it, Clark's special duties. The first time I went on was a night duty. There were all men <laughs> sitting there on the wireless sets and uh, teleprinters and all the rest of it. And it wasn't a big room at all. There was a, a counter in front. And you had to log everything that happened on the station. Vic, cue the queen. You were plugged to the operations table by a uh, little cable and earphones. And your information was 
um, sent in on those plugs from the observer corps or whoever was plotting at that stage or finding the enemy aircraft were coming at you and what there were. There weren't a great many at the beginning there, but it gradually sort of got more and more busy as time went on. If some found this transition to the established masculine world bewildering, others would soon find themselves drafted into very non-traditional and specialized areas of the defense network. I had seen pictures on the movies of girls with what looked like croupier's rakes, kind of bending over a table, pushing things around, and I thought this looked rather fun. And I asked if I could be one of them. The man said, oh, well, that's a radar operator. And he put me down for the trade of radar operator there and then. Well, of course, he was wrong. Um, people leaning over the table with groupies rakes were plotters. I don't know whether he made a mistake and put me in that trade by accident or whether he was being devious and cunning because he wanted me to be a radar operator. Radar would play a vital part in the coming battles. Detecting enemy aircraft by means of radio waves, the warning signals would appear on a small screen as an echoed trace of light. The radar operator's job was to interpret this display, providing essential information that would allow RAF fighters to intercept incoming enemy aircraft and destroy them. by a very, very senior RAF officer, and he got us all lined up, and he said, if anybody's got any conscientious objections to being involved in bombing, they must say so now, and we will have no hard feelings. You'll go back where you've come from. Well, nobody moved an inch. Everybody was simply delighted to get a chance to get back at them. As we saw them building up, it used to go around like wildfire. All 200 plus are coming up, you know, and we're for it. It is a very tense time because you've got to get it absolutely right because everybody is depending on you, especially the pilots. Then a controller would say, from readiness to scramble, and off they would go. And then the tannoy would still be on, so we would hear them in battle. Bandits ahead! Bandits ahead! He'd say Vector 2000, you know, and then they'd say Bandits ahead, or Bandits below. And these were coming and going the whole time, so the atmosphere was quite electric. Tandem blue section, head on attack. Lanyard leader calling. Tally ho, tally ho. Tally-ho, which I think very often broke the, su the suspense of the thing. As I, which I remember mostly and think, oh, thank God for that, it's, you know, they, they, it's, it's on now and, you know, please God, let it be over quickly. <laughs> Signals would be coming in to say that they were coming our way and we were going to get bombed. And all this was coming in and going out, the wireless was going mad, absolute mayhem. But people were calm. The controller would broadcast all personnel not on duty, take cover.
once the raid had finished, then all the signals would come in of who was missing, if somebody was down in the drink, who had been shot down, uh, who was definitely dead, who was missing. So all the signals had to be collated, um, people informed. You can't ever detract from the work that the, these young ladies did. On duty, probably up to eight hours, um, they had to be able to pick up and uh, run with uh, 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 an engagement uh, or stand or sit for long periods of inactivity. Um, I tend to think that the lady was far better than the man at doing this job. Um, the lady's voice is normally clearer and comes over the mic uh, much more clearly than a male voice and uh, very cool, calm and collected. Um, so they did an absolutely vital role uh, during the battle. The girls were very, very good at plotting the aircraft and giving the controller every assistance. They were excellent. M much, much better than the men, really, because the men were too impatient, whereas the girls would sit there all night doing a little bit of knitting and sewing and just listening to the phone. In the meantime, then they learned to respect us and realised that we would sit through any air raid, anything that they threw at us, and as women, we were no more scared than they were. They had no fear of rolling their sleeves up and getting their hands dirty either. Women moved onto the factory floor, learning traditionally male skills. I trained to be a welder which you had to have a test. You had to weld two bits of metal together and if they didn't come apart, then you passed, which I did. Although I say it myself, I was a good welder. I was trained to become an aluminium welder, which was much more difficult. The women were soon to make up the bulk of the workforce, manufacturing the weapons of war. There'd be a, a row of girls in a line doing these sting guns and you would uh, be past another one, you'd weld the key plate on what was called then onto this sting gun and just sling them and another one would come over. And we used to turn them out by the hundreds. Women were becoming an essential part of the war effort, taking up trades and occupations never previously considered. But during the Battle of Britain, women were to break into the most male-dominated area of all. When you see a neatly uniformed little waff walking along the street, you mostly think of her as doing clerical work. But there's much more to it than that. This is a squad busy servicing one of the trainers. In 1940, as the threat to Britain grew, women were determined that their expertise and capabilities should be recognised and applied to defending Britain against Nazi aggression. Everybody had something to do, and everybody was pulling their weight that I knew about, that I met, because they wanted to win the war. As the Luftwaffe sent larger and larger formations of bombers and escorting fighters across the channel, every trained pilot in fighter command was needed for combat duty. Clearly, this was a very male-dominated environment. Girls flying aeroplanes was, was almost a sin at that time. I'd have paid them to let me do it. It seemed a superb job. But even though many men saw it as highly inappropriate, some adventurous women had already become qualified pilots. I wanted to get away from governesses and nannies and chaperones. We were never left alone in those days, you see. And I thought, well, if I go flying, they can't come with me. I started flying when I was a schoolgirl because, um, I was not very good at, at hockey, and so I was allowed to go to the aerodrome and have a flying lesson instead of playing hockey. 
and from there on, and I thought that was great. With hundreds of new fighter aircraft rolling out of the factories, someone had to fly each one of these machines to the hard-pressed squadrons around the country. This was the job of the Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, a newly created organization. But with only a limited number of male pilots available who were not eligible for combat flying, the service was severely understaffed. There was a wonderful woman called Pauline Gar. Her idea was that women could be used too, and they said, oh no, poor women must be kept having babies and they must be kept at the kitchen sink, they're no good for flying. Pauline pulled the strings. Her father was a member of parliament, and she got permission to start a pool of women at Hatfield, and she had eight women pilots to start with. I heard on the radio that they wanted pilots, so I applied, and, and uh, they accepted me. The ATA um, initially said, well, the girls can, with training, fly tiger moths and little aeroplanes and like that, but as for uh, anything else, um, no, they couldn't do that. To start with, the men gave them all the nasty jobs, tiger moths, open tiger moths, ooh, to Scotland in the winter. And then after that, they were gradually moved up until they were allowed to fly everything. Uh, eventually, we were flying all these fast and furious aeroplanes and bombers all over the country. The ATA proved that girls could do this job. With the original eight establishing their capabilities, the ATA had no hesitation in calling upon the women of Britain to train as delivery pilots. My interest in flying was chiefly through the interest in boyfriends who flew. All my first boyfriends were the Air Force people who were training. And uh, I don't know, I probably, to make intelligent conversation, uh, my sister and I used to take a, a, this a book called The Aeroplane. It's a monthly journal, I believe it still exists. And um, in there one day we saw that ATA had uh, used up all its qualified pilots and were training ab initio, and we both applied and we both got in. And so I suppose it wasn't any deep interest in flying as such, because I knew nothing about flying. But if the women thought they were going to be trained to the level of combat pilots, they were to be disappointed. They scaled down our training to what they thought we would need to, to pick up an aircraft and deliver it safely from A to B. And they said, if you run into bad weather, don't be a, try to be a hero, land and wait till it clears, because the aeroplane is, is most important. Once proficient in basic flying skills, the women of the ATA had to take further training in many other types of aircraft, from single-engine fighters to multi-engine bombers. Very proud moment, of course. You were given your chitties and you went off to London and got measured for your uniform and you couldn't wait for the first time you went home in uniform with your wings up. <laughs> but even after proving themselves as capable as any male pilot, they still encountered entrenched attitudes. We were issued originally with a skirt and then we growled about it and said, oh no, no, we must have trousers. So with a rather bad grace, they issued us with rather good looking navy blue boiler suits with our rank badges on the shoulder. But at the same time as they gave us these boiler suits, a notice went on to the notice board in the various ferry pools saying, all women pilots will remove their trousers immediately after landing. You weren't allowed to dine in the mess with, in trousers in those days. You were given your meal in the ladies' room, as I remember it and you were, you were given a bed in the, the WAF's quarters, which was well away from the mess, and usually on some stations, not the sort of the big pre-war ones, but in many stations, it was the coldest Nissen hut in the, the coldest, farthest corner of the airfield. With the women now established as regular pilots in the ATA, they soon settled into the wartime routine of the job. We go out with our parachutes, and a map bag, which was one of the most important things, map case. You spend about three hours waiting for the aircraft to be ready. 
then you get in, you go to the control tower, permission for takeoff that you were ferrying, and uh, they tell you if it was okay to go. So you get in, start up, and then you get a green light and uh, take off. We didn't have radio. We flew in without radio. Well, you flew with maps, and you knew England like the back of your hand. You had to have your routes to avoid the balloons, which were around all the big cities. There were occasions when, when uh, you couldn't rely on the map and, and the weather together because you couldn't see, so you had to follow the railway line. And it was very disconcerting when you suddenly discovered that there's no railway line and the, the, the thing had gone into a tunnel. <laughs> it was terrifying. And in spite of the danger in flying alone in the skies above England in 1940, these women pilots were denied the chance to defend themselves if attacked. We might have had ammunition in, but the guns weren't caught, so we were virtually you were unarmed, you couldn't shoot back. Anyway, you hadn't been taught how to. So you were just a delivery pilot, that was all, taking it somewhere. They didn't teach us to instrument fly because we were supposed to fly within sight of the ground so that our ground defences could defend us. In fact, they often shot at us by mistake, especially over the Bristol Channel, and difficult to tell the difference between a, a hurricane and a fog in any old German aircraft. But I think we would have had far less grey hairs if we'd been taught how to fly an instrument, just a little bit. I was shot at when I was flying a Spitfire, but the weather was um, very bad, actually, and I think I strayed across the coast near Bournemouth, which I should not have done, and I saw these puffs, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm being shot at. So I quickly turned round, and then I had to find the aerodrome, which was not very far away and uh, I landed quite happily. <laughs> no damage done. It was hard work, uh, delivering them, getting them the different ones, and your mind was on a good landing, and handing it over, and, and the papers all signed and handed over properly. I once remember flying a Spitfire to some place, and as I landed, another... Uh, Spitfire landed exactly the same and we were both on the runway at the same time going different ways having just landed and we hadn't seen each other at all so it was an absolute miracle that we didn't collide. To many the appearance of a female pilot emerging from the cockpit of an aircraft came as a complete surprise. As I landed, a little car came out with a notice on the back of it saying, follow me, so I taxied after it to dispersal. And then when I got to dispersal, I switched off and did all the things one does and um, let myself out down the ladder with my parachute and things. And, and there was a crowd of RAF people <laughs> waiting there to take me uh, to the control. And I said, w well, can we now please go to the control so that I can get my paper signed? And they said, um, well, no, we're waiting for the pilot. And I said, I am the pilot. And they wouldn't believe me. And so two of them <laughs> went up in the aeroplane to search. And they came out and said, there's nobody there. <laughs> I remember putting down the, my aircraft had something wrong, I was using too much juice, so I put down for some petrol. And uh, the man who was going to fill it up, he said, Good Lord, if it's a girl, I heard him say to the other one. The pilots of the RAF soon began to appreciate the job these women were doing. This ATA. The service was really very important. And uh, the fact that the girls were there, you see, it's, 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 it's great credit to them. This, this was a really 
uh, uh, active part in, in, in the war, uh, as, as close as they could get. Of course, it was a wonderful feeling. People say you had no contact with the ground, but it was very nice that one didn't. One felt on one's own up there, as though you were flying, or you couldn't have someone from the ground saying, you shouldn't be there, or it's time to come down, or you're too high, or you're too low. You were completely on your own. A better job than working in a factory or on a gun site or some of the awful jobs that people had to do. It was, one, it was the best job in the world, wasn't it? Imagine being given all those wonderful airplanes to fly. Brand new, most of them. Women now had the taste of freedom. But these steps towards equality brought problems as the women moved ever further into male territory. The preconceived concepts and customs of both sexes were about to be shattered. I fell in love with the nailman who had big blue eyes. I used to watch him doing crazy things in the sky. With thousands we of women now thing. swelling the military ranks, the change was inevitable. What happened there is my Even affair, so, and the I'm not decided you. it was we not going to have one and set of rules for men and, men and another for women. And when we straighten this out, was the introduction to military neck, life. It was an introduction the into a man's world. But I'm nobody in baby now. We'd had a thing called an FFI which stood for free from infection. And it was really rather horrendous. <laughs> there were lines and rows of waves lined up with nothing but a bath towel and a pair of knickers on. And you had to queue up and wait your turn to see the MO and be duly inspected to make quite sure you hadn't got anything unpleasant. And I must admit that the sight of some of the other WAFs gave me a bit of a cultural shock because I, I hadn't realised that people came in such shapes and sizes. We were billeted just outside the main gates in Wood Lane, in the married quarters. Um, very few WAF around, and Molly, the CO, I never knew her second name, she was a section officer, and uh, she used to ride around on a bike saying, you're all right, girls, you know I'm Molly. And that's how informal it was then. I went into West Brayton the first time and saw an officer coming towards me. I thought, what a good idea, I'll try my salute out on him. Poor fellow, I forgot that I had a bag of apples under my arm. <laughs> he was gone. He sprayed with apples all over the place. I'd never left home before. And uh, when I arrived, I was shattered by the, the company I had to keep in a, in a large dormitory about 12 or 15 people and um, who swore at each other and used the most ghastly language. You didn't have to like them necessarily and they certainly didn't like you but you were all doing the same job and when the war was on everybody was pulling on the same side. Everybody was helping every airplane was delivered. It was your little war effort, one in the eye for Hitler. The women were soon taking on the pressures of active service 24 hours a day. You go like 8 to 1, and then you're off duty until midnight, and then you go on 12 to 8, and then you go on 6 to 12, and then you have 24 hours off, and then you start the cycle all over again, and your body never gets adjusted to being asleep. And, and the, the huts were shared between the watches, so you get people coming crashing in. How were you trying to get your sleep in after being on night watch? 1,300 hours to 1,700 hours, came off at 1,700 hours, went on at 2359 to 0800, came off at 0800, went on at 1,700 hours to 2359, came off at 2359, went on at 0800 to 1,200 again. So we didn't have a lot of time, so one in three nights was sleep. And you think that we could enjoy ourselves when we were absolutely shattered. They also experienced the challenges of remaining alert during long hours of tedium. 
some days where you were sitting around, the weather was foul and you couldn't do anything, you were just sitting in the mess all day, very bored, not having done anything all day except sit and wait. When there were quiet times, you put your head on the wireless or the teleprinting to try and have a kip. But then you'd knit or, or you'd play cards or, or something like that, or you'd chat. But there are very few times when you hadn't got anything to do. Of course, everybody smoked in those days. Absolutely everybody smoked, especially on radar, because you were not allowed on the set operating for more than one hour at a time. When you were off, you went to a little restroom, and, of course, you immediately had a cigarette, a cup of tea or coffee. In this environment, it wasn't long before the realities of the situation entered previously sheltered lives. That was quite innocent when I first went there, but working with men, <laughs> it broadened my mind. Occasionally, some twit would leave his radio on, which would uh, educate the uh, WAF uh, operators uh, on the control board, and no doubt it increased their uh, swearing vocabulary. We were all mixed together, and because the war was on, possibly, we learned a lot of rude words and cursing and swearing and things like that from the men. Quite ripe at times. <laughs> I mean, uh, I learned a few words I'd never heard before. I suppose it was the adrenaline going, you know. Although my memory of the men is that they were very sweet about that. They, they did try to keep their language as clean as they could. Working and living in such close proximity, other barriers were being broken down. One of the absolute criminal things in the Air Force is you must never walk in front of the CO's car. So me blithely ignoring all the red tape and all the rest of it, dozy as anything, walked straight across the CO in front of the CO's car when a voice said, you air woman, you've walked in front of the CO's car. Uh, oh dear, turned round, walked back, gave the CO a kiss and said, sorry, sorry. It was a six week training and in the middle of it all I got mumps. It wasn't as bad as it might have been because there was this rather nice Canadian pilot there and as he was the only one with mumps apart from me, we were told to rather sort of get together and amuse each other, which we duly did without much difficulty. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> For some women, life amongst the men had its teasing moments. I went out and the aircraft wouldn't start. And it would stop for three days. So every day I rang my CEO and said, something wrong with this aircraft. I pressed the button, nothing happened, you know. So he got rather upset because he wanted his aircraft back for his other pupils to fly, not being sitting with some stupid little cadet who couldn't get it going. And what it was, it, they'd taken all the plugs out. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't go, and I was there for three days, and that's where I met my fiancé. With the uncertainty of war came a dramatic overturning of old rules of morality. It was the beginning of a revolution that a later generation would claim as its own. I used to phone my wife from outside the camp. One day I went to the telephone box to phone the wife, and inside the telephone box was a couple, um, <coughs> not phoning, but um, got hold of one another's phones, like, you know. The whole world of radar was totally and completely secret. You could hear these people muttering and mumbling and say, and they do say that if you stand in front of the aerials, you'll be safe for the evening with your girlfriend because it makes you sterile. And they would all go and they'd get as close as they could without the barbed wire stopping them in order to have a jolly evening. There was no truth in that story at all because a lot of my good friends have had very large families. To some women, it, it was a, a good time to go out with men and, uh, I mean, there were the ones on the bikes, definitely, uh, and the pilots knew them, but the, on the whole, they respected the girls that said no. 
everybody was scared of getting pregnant. We were brought up in those days that uh, don't you dare, because uh, if you bring trouble home here, my girl, you're out the door. Although I was a bit naive, I think, I found out a few girls did get pregnant, and if they were in the services, they were immediately released. Quite frankly, I never got involved with the WAP. It was too near home. It was dangerous. Well, if you can't enjoy yourself as a 17, 18, 19-year-old, I don't know when you will. Are you allowed to go out with boys for the first time? We had lots of boyfriends, and the boys had lots of girlfriends. And it was a perfectly relaxed relationship. We didn't belong to each other in any way at all. Woe betide you if you gave your young man the impression that he belonged to you, because that was a kiss of death. He would sugar off as fast as he could go, because he'd be scared that you'd got your claws into him. You had to treat it as, as a very light, but it didn't mean that you didn't have a nice relationship. You had a very nice relationship, but you might have another, even nicer one with another boy who'd ask you out. And that wasn't being grotty and unfaithful, because it wasn't incumbent on you to be faithful unless somebody asked you to marry him and then you were engaged and that was that. You didn't go out with other people who didn't want to. With the grim life or death struggle, emotions and the pace of life intensified. Many young men and women lived their lives and fast forward as death could be just around the corner. I didn't really think of being killed. I don't think anybody did, because you're so busy. If you were sitting in a cockpit thinking, I wonder I will be killed, you'd probably run into something. We weren't allowed to walk in pairs on the station during the Battle of Britain. It was all singles. You, you could not walk in pairs because of machine gunning. We heard bombs dropping, so we we realised that, th that there were enemy and that something was happening. I uh, started walking and then uh, my friend stopped and shouted at me, don't move. And I stood there and there were, I looked down and there were, I don't know how to describe it actually, I thought they were crickets or something, you know, movement in the ground. And. Um, when it finished, he said, those were live bullets. And I was rooted to the spot for a moment. I just didn't, I couldn't believe it. You didn't think. You just felt that, well, it was somebody else. It would never happen to you. hear it you never hear the one that comes down I was blown through the uh, doors of ops right through over the counter signals counter onto a wireless set had my back broken which wasn't very pleasant and I reported sick because I couldn't move and the MO said to me that was the only time I did report sick he said oh well we've got plenty of dead bodies around just lean against a radiator for 48 hours and then you're back on duty so. <laughs> Somebody decided that we'd all go down to Leicester Square. There was a nightclub there, or a club. And I said, you can go if you like, but I'm not going. And it was a night that it got bombed. I just couldn't bring myself to go. It's strange. That was strange. <laughs> In September 1940, the Luftwaffe changed its tactics. On orders from Hitler and the High Command, the attacks on Britain were to concentrate on London and other centres of population. Now the violence and destruction of war was to come to the people of Britain's cities and towns as Nazi warplanes brought death from the air.
With Britain's cities bombed repeatedly by night and day, the terrible reality of aerial warfare was brought home to all. Whether military or civilian, young or old, all sections of society lived with the ever-present threat of destruction and death. You would arrange to meet people and they just wouldn't be there. And somebody would tell you, John's bullshit today, he won't be here. And it happened so many times. I enjoyed the flying. The part one didn't enjoy was numerous friends and relatives getting killed, which wasn't funny. It happened to everybody. You went out a lot, partly to forget your lost friends. It was, it was just, you felt that, that, that let us enjoy ourselves while we can because we might not be here tomorrow and your partner who took you out to dinner might not be there. We live for today. It was a very sad time, really, because boys I'd known at school with... And, and I can see now, well, after I flew, I realised how little experience they had had. They were having 12, 14, 15 hours on a Spitfire after learning to fly and then being put into the Battle of Britain. And uh, quite a few of the boys I was at school with, the news was coming back in that, uh, that they were... That they, that we'd had the casualties. My fiancé, Humphrey Gilbert, I rang up and couldn't get hold of him. And I'd had a cross country, which took me over his Debden, his station, and I couldn't find his aircraft. His aircraft was a stick with a blue nose. And so the blue nose stick wasn't there. And because it wasn't there, I realised he must have got bumped off. I felt terrific sorrow for speaking to a pilot one day or passing a joke with him one day and the next minute he was killed, feeling miserable about it. But then you've got to get on with it. You can't, you can't grieve, you can't fret. Biggin Hill got bombed. And the news came through that many WEF had been killed. And I think they were probably the first WEF killed during the war. And we were, all of us were absolutely shattered. And that they would be women casualties. I think that shook us more than anything. And one accepted the casualties, I think, far more than they do today. When we lost a friend, it, it was uh, rather horrid and really unthinkable because I lost a friend who happened to be billeted in the same house as myself. Uh, but uh, I was not allowed to fly for two or three days, and, and then I was flying again, and one had to think, uh, well, that's life. And so carry on. <laughs> and horrors of war, women had lived a much more liberated life. But once the victory was won and fighting men returned, the old order began to reassert itself. Women had six years of managing without their men, and they did it, you know. They, they took on the whole responsibility of the household. And not only that, but they went out to work because before the war, if you were working and you got married, you had to leave your job. You weren't allowed to work if you were married. And uh, they found that they were capable. And after the war, they didn't want to go back to being just the little housewife. Well, I wanted to go on flying and doing this wonderful job. I mean, uh, we were so lucky. I still look back and think, how did I manage it? A lot of the uh, more experienced women in the ATA would have loved to have gone on in some capacity. And by the time, I believe, in the 50s that Dan Eyre took the first women pilots, 
of course our more senior people were getting a little older then so they had no chance it didn't come overnight this this uh, uh, equality <laughs> Faced with the uncertainty and the destruction of war, the women of Britain rose to the challenge. The door of equality had been thrown open, but it would be their daughters that would finally rush through it. We have a lot to be thankful for, for the, the women and what they did during the war. I mean, there wasn't a job going that a man did that, that the women didn't take over. The whole country really would have come to a standstill without the help of the women. Being an ATA pilot was fantastic. I hope that everybody had as much fun flying as I did, which wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been the war. I happened to be the right age. I happened to be in the right place at the right moment. I wouldn't have missed it. It was the best part of my life. I was wicked. I never wanted the war to end. <laughs>